Hi, everyone. Oh, that's cool. The music kind of stopped, and then everybody got quiet. That's great. Uh, my name is Mano Marks. I know a lot of you out here, and so this is really great. It's really great to be here uh, to see uh, a lot of familiar faces and also a lot of new ones. Uh, this is Pamela Fox here. She's flown in for Sid from Sydney for this, so we are really, uh, really privileged to have this. So uh, this is our, uh, our talk is what you don't know about uh, geo APIs can't hurt you. And um, really, it's a grab bag session, right? We're, we're going to show you a lot of really cool stuff, some of it new, some of it's been around for a little while that not a lot of people are using yet or we just think is really, really kind of cool. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go through it. Uh, I'm about halfway through, we're going to switch computers. And at that point, we will take a couple of questions, and then we'll have questions at the end. I'm not going to do, if, if anybody's been to any of my presentations, usually I like to have a lot more sort of give and take. This format's probably not, not the best for that. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Ooh. All right, so the world of Geo APIs. So you know we've got uh, we've got a ton of APIs here at Google. We've got Maplets, the JavaScript Maps API, the Maps API for Flash, Panoramio, Maps State API, Static Maps, KML, Earth API, and uh, and SketchUp API. And I'm sure we're forgetting some like visualization stuff and there's a, there's a bunch of other things. And we're not obviously going to cover every piece of that here. Otherwise, it would just be one slide for per thing. Uh, what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to talk uh, mostly about Earth and SketchUp related things. So I've got, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Google Earth, the touring, and the HTML support. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about SketchUp, and then we're going to switch over to, to Pamela. OK, so how many of you played around with Google Earth 5.0? All right. So then you probably know that we added uh, touring support. Now, Turing uh, got at something that, uh, that developers have been asking for for quite some time, which was much more complete control over the camera experience. And also added in a couple of other interesting things, like, uh, like uh, control over the time slider, control over, uh, control over sound, and the ability to do, well, there's a bunch of things here. Move the camera, move the move models, animate polygons, change where your place marks are, and show the new historical imagery that we have in, uh, in Google Earth, which allows you to look back in time at different, uh, at different satellite imagery. So this is your, uh, your basic tour here. You see uh, it's got a tour element. I'm a little hampered by this, because usually I jump up and down and point to things and can't quite do that here. Um, it's got your uh, tour element uh, playlist, which is just you know play of uh, all the 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 points that are the things that are going to happen, and then a fly to which uh, shows you a camera, which has you know th all the the things that normally associate with a camera. So what this does is it flies you to this particular location when the the tour is loaded. So uh, there's something you may notice here. You'll see there's a uh, prefix on some of these elements, the GX prefix. This is uh, part of the extension namespace, the Google extension namespace to KML. Um, if I had a full uh, tour here, which I might have uh, later, you'd see the actual namespace declaration. Um, so this is, uh, this is part of the KML standards process. The, the uh, Open Geospatial Consortium, which adopted KML as a, as a standard last year, built in an extension mechanism, which allows uh, people to innovate within KML 2.2 and, uh, and add in things that are, uh, that are interesting for their application and that they hope will eventually become part of the KML standard. So that's what we've done. We're, we're, trying, we're innovating and trying to show you new and fun things. OK, so here's a, uh, here's a sound cue. Uh, Pamela wanted me to make this actually much bigger, but I just wanted to show how easy it was to add sound by having a lot of white space around it. Three lines, uh, you know, uh, two el one, uh, one element and a, and a child, put in a sound cue. It plays that when, uh, when that part of the tour is triggered. Uh, here's uh, how you change the imagery. You'll see here you've got the, the camera just like we had before, the fly to, but uh, I added in a timestamp. 
and what that does is it tells uh, Earth when this thing takes place so that it can then go through and change the imagery to uh, the historical imagery to that, um, to, that to whatever most uh, matches that timestamp. And I'm gonna give a little demo of touring later that'll show you a little bit more about these things. And here's quickly how you move a model. It uses update. So many of you, how many of you would consider yourself KML developers? Okay, that's, that's more than usual for Google I.O. <laughs> um, how many of you have actually played around with the update tags before? All right, that's good. Okay, so that's a good number. Um, update is one of those things that's, that's kind of hard to get right, and it's, it's basically how do you add a little bit of dynamism to a scripting language, to a scripting dynamism rather to a declarative language. Um, and it basically allows you to do incremental updates, uh, changes, deletions, additions to your, uh, to whatever place marks have already been loaded. Well, we've adopted that also for, uh, for touring, and you'll see that all, uh, that all is the standard KML namespace except for the animated update and the duration. And this basically just allows you to, to change the position of a 3D model. So no more do you have to create multiple model elements with lots of timestamps at slightly different locations to achieve an animation effect. What you get instead is changing the location this way. So, um, okay. So uh, we can add it very easily into, uh, into the Google Earth API. So you can load a tour using the Earth browser plugin. And you'll see here are some very simple JavaScript uh, you, you, you do fetch KML, um, check and see if it's actually a KML object, and then append, uh, append the um, KML object to your DOM, and then you walk through and you look for uh, KML tours and, um, and add it. This is based on uh, Roman Nurek's uh, touring samples, which I'm gonna show you in just a minute. So that's... There's a page on earth.google.com. I, I one thing I don't like about Chrome is it grays out the, the depth and the, the URL, but I'll put that URL into the slides so that'll be available later. These are, uh, these are basic tours. And this is where we'll get, um, if we can have the sound turned on, um, I'll uh, play you the Jimmy Buffett tour. It's already actually started. <laughs> Jimmy Buffett is a fan of Google Earth and he helped with our launch. Uh, and you'll see here uh, the nice, uh, one of the nice fun features is I think, yes, we're gonna actually go underwater right now. So those of you who haven't played yet with the Google Earth uh, 5.0 ocean features, you can actually go under the water and, and Okay, and I'm going to uh, next show you another interesting one. This will still require some sound. Um, this is... Historical imagery dating back to the oh. early 1960s tells a story of change. Lake Chad was once the sixth largest lake in the world. Persistent droughts and increased diversion of water for irrigation have reduced it to roughly one-tenth its size 40 years ago. So in the past, what you uh, to achieve these kind of effects, and uh, I'm sorry if you if you want to see more of this, this is th these are all on the website. Um, to achieve this kind of effect, you would have had to get Google Earth, create the KMLs around it, play through, do a screen capture using either Movie Maker, which is part of Google Earth Pro, or some other screen capture uh, software, and then script through, record the uh, record it using a, um, recording it using a microphone, they use a, a separate recording of the, the audio, and then just, and then sync them up together. And it was, it would have been a lot more cumbersome uh, experience. And now instead of that, instead of watching what looks actually to me like a video, you're actually watching Google Earth in action here. Uh, so play this tour, continue playing the tour, 
you'll see it, it makes changes, and I can actually the move around within the environment in the 1990s, there. In the 1990s, as much as In ways in which the original tour author may not have intended, but that's okay because you're the user and you're in control. So I think touring is one of the most exciting aspects of the, uh, the Google Earth 5 launch, and also the fact that we can incorporate it now within Go um, the Google Earth uh, plugin and inload them using the Earth API, just it gives you a tremendous amount of, pow of power. Okay. So I wanted to talk um, to you, in, uh, in the latest version of Google Earth, we added uh, HTML support. So um, what that means is, uh, what that means is you basically can run a browser within your description balloons. It's not, uh, it's not 100%, it's not full, it's very close to that, and the documentation, it, it tells you where the little bits of limitations are. One of the key, um, the key points of, of limitations is you can't do cookies. Um, so not yet do we allow advertising if using, uh, using Google Ads, but uh, I think you can see where this is going. Um, <laughs> but you get JavaScript support, you get iframes, you can have a full, rich experience within your description balloon uh, within Google Earth 5.0. And, um, and we started supporting, lim doing limited support for HTML5. And you know, we talk about, we talk about that a lot in this conference, so you can see that where we're gonna go with that is probably, uh, is much more complete uh, uh, HTML5 support. Right now we, uh, we use Qt uh, WebKit 4.5, and that, uh, and so you can look and see what that supports, and that's what we support on the PC. Um, I'm not sure, uh, I forget the back end, but that we're using HTML5, but actually we have uh, video and audio support within the description balloon just using the tags from HTML5. Okay, so here all I have is show sample, and Pamela looked at me and said, is it really, that's just what you wanted to do? Um, I always find it kind of cumbersome to put like a full range of KML in, uh, into a slide. The slides are, I'm, slides are messy. I don't, I, they're, they're, they're like this data sink and I have, a, I have a little bit of a problem having to actually use them because I like Google Earth as, as my, uh, my presentation uh, platform. But uh, I, I know people like them, so. Anyway, but I, I, I pr much prefer a text editor. So you'll see here I've got KML, and this is where I'd want to jump up and point to the namespace. Uh, you'll see right, let's see if I can, I can just highlight it right here. Uh, you'll see here the, this line is the, uh, the extension namespace for, uh, for Google Earth, uh, Google Earth 5.0 using uh, our extension features. And you'll see in here that I've created a fairly simple form uh, so you've got a place mark with a name and a description, and within that I've got my HTML, and you'll see form uh, gives a method, it gives an action, which is uh, just something that's running on a local host, and, um, and it just, this is very simple, it just asks you to input a name, and what, uh, what it does on the back end is it puts that name into a MySQL database. So I'm gonna actually show you this in action. It's not exciting, obviously, but I think it's exciting for what it can actually, you can actually do. You'll see here, form, name, form in balloon, put in name, I'm gonna put in Pamela because I put in Mano before, and I, su I submit, and you'll see, actually, it takes me to the next page within the description balloon, and, so, and gives me back, Pam, you know, gives me back a HTML page. That's all just running off my local host because you know, when I'm presenting at a conference, I never want to run things off the web if I can help it. Um, okay, so that's a, that's a fairly simple example there. I wanted to show you uh, another one. This, is, this just takes the basic Google Maps API sample. Uh, I, I kind of love this sort of, I, I know I, I love things that are kind of meta. I'm putting a map inside a description balloon that runs in Google Earth. Um, fairly. Uh, Fairly simple, but just takes the the, the standard um, map basic map sample. I load this up, and 
I get a map, a slippy map within the balloon in Google Earth. Now, for those of you who struggled through Earth, uh, uh, you know, up to 4.2, 4.3, and had to, you know, struggle within the restrictions of rich text with no dynamic forms involved. I think that at that point, at this point, you might be really excited to see the uh, the range of support that we have. Okay. And I think, given the amount of time, I'm going to move on to uh, the HTML5 support. There I am, flipping between my browsers. Okay. So, uh, oh, just a quick uh, notes on the limitations. The full HTML support is not uh, not yet available in uh, in Maps. So, if you load a KML file into Google Maps, you, you will you will it'll strip out all the JavaScript and and all that. And we have some differences in the way it's implemented in the Earth plugin. You can talk to myself or Roman about that more later at office hours. Um, and those are those issues, both the Maps and the Earth plugin, is done for uh, is for reasons of security. So uh, I wanted to quickly show you an HTML5 uh, sample. Okay. So what I've done here is I've created a, a web page HTML5 test. You'll see in here it's got a function, a draw canvas. It's this is just to be honest, a sample I took off the web. Somebody was was demonstrating capabilities of Canvas. It just draws a uh, a yellow box inside Canvas element, and uh, and that's it. And then it'll say your browser does not support the Canvas tag if if in fact it does not. And we can then load this up. So I, I created that web page and then I load it using an iframe on um, on. In the in the actual KML, and we'll show some of the the tags that we have here. Let's see. So you'll see there it drew the yellow the yellow box. It gives you a little, you know, a little statement as to what uh, what browsers support it. You'll see here, uh, sort of. I think it's a little idiosyncratic so far what uh, Qt WebKit is supporting. They decided to support the dialog tag. So dialog basically takes a bunch of form of uh, things that you put in in dialog format and then creates a default dialog. So I can show you what that looks like in the HTML. That's this part right here. So this it creates a a dialog style for you. Uh, and so this is one of the new HTML five tags and. I'm kind of curious why they chose to implement that instead of, say, video, but uh, <laughs> it's it's probably because it was fairly easy to do and video is a little bit harder. So uh, that's uh, that's where we are with that. Uh, and as I said, I, if you uh, if you loaded this onto a Mac, you'd have some you'd have audio support directly in the description balloon and video as well. Okay, so the next thing I, I want to mention is the SketchUp API. This will actually be the last thing before uh, before I switch over to Pamela, and we'll should be talking about uh, 2D maps. You can see her uh, getting all excited there. And um, so Google SketchUp runs a uh, has a uh, has a uh, Ruby API. So it basically allows you to do really interesting things within uh, SketchUp, like move models around, uh, attach metadata to them, change uh, change their shape, change their sizes, and all that sort of thing. That's sort of fun goodness. I don't have time to go uh, too deeply into um, into what it can do, but I w instead I want to show you a demo. And I'm, the demo that I'm going to show you is uh, Sketchy Physics, and this is available for free. You can download this, on, download this online. Uh, it does some really fun stuff, uh, it basically is a physics engine within Google SketchUp. And if I play play right here, you'll see these things drop and kind of fall around. But uh, even more fun, I can pick it up, move it around, I can, it'll bash into things, 
I don't know. That's that's my the, that's that's what I I just spend I just spend time going, you know moving things around and bashing them into things because maybe I didn't get to do enough of that when I was a child. I don't know. Um, and uh, this and so that I think is a really fun uh, fun start. This is even more fun. I think this is uh, shows doing a ragdoll physics within. Google SketchUp, and so far, you know, hands-free here, you just see it, it's, uh, it's flopping about in this, this ragdoll fashion. And then I can pick it up and drag it around and do all sorts of fun, interesting stuff with this. So, uh, you know, aside from all the, you know, the, the fun that I can show you with bashing things around, people are using this for really serious applications, basically for doing data presentation of things like uh, molecular physics and, um, you know, to show car crashes and, and lots of other interesting things that, uh, that are really meaningful. But you all are developers. I want to show you the fun stuff. Right. Okay. So I think I am done. I'm going to switch over to Pamela. And while we're doing that switch over, if we could have some, if, if there are any questions on anything we talked about or going to talk about, there's some microphones uh, up there. No questions? Ah, Mike. You can always count on Mike. Yes. Mono, it doesn't seem like the uh, when I th the JavaScript works in a KML file in a balloon, but if I try to load it from the Ma from the Earth API and I've got JavaScript in it there, it doesn't seem to go through. Is that? Yes, uh, that's uh, we we're still working out some of the security things on that. Um, you can talk to Roman and I at office hours about some of the okay. details on that later. Yes. And and we do hope to have a full. HTML support within the description balloons and the plugin. <laughs> Look at Roman, like, I think I just announced something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Van. Could you yes. just repeat the office hours? I was getting lunch. <laughs> oh, uh, we, I think uh, they're, they're on, the, um, on the office hours list on your card, but I think, uh, I think we'll be doing uh, 2 and 3 o'clock, so KML and the Earth API. And there's stuff going, there's people there all day, so even if we're not there. Any other questions? No? Pamela, are you uh, about ready? Yeah. Um, mm, Excellent. Let me bring this down so I can see. I just had a tweet. Oh. Do, 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 do. do you guys all remember this? All right, sweet, good. All right, so enough of that boring 3D flashy stuff. Let's talk about 2D maps APIs, because that's where it's at. 3D is too hard to use. You have to use multiple fingers. It's too hard. Everything I do in life, I have to do while I'm eating food. So I can't possibly use Earth while I'm also eating food. Sorry, you should see my keyboard. It's covered in lunch and alcohol and disgusting things. All right, so I'm going to start off with some old stuff, starting going way back with driving directions, which we actually launched, I think, like the second month that I was an official employee, like two years ago. Um, so most of you, you know, probably know we have driving directions. Um, and pretty standard, you know, you can load from here to there. You can also load up to 25 different waypoints if you want to do, you know, a massive road trip. Uh, we added the ability to avoid highways, since I hate highways. Uh, we added the ability to walk, since I can't actually drive. Um, and so once we've catered to everything that I need, um, we have a pretty nice API. Uh, and there's some stuff that people have done that I just want to point out. It's kind of different uses of the directions API. So first of all, um, you guys know on Google Maps, there's draggable driving directions, and, and people really love this because um, they can customize their route. We didn't offer this natively in the API, um, but people figured out that really you can just do it yourself. And uh, so here we go. I, I made my start and end. And so this is purely just using the API. So really, you can get the same experience that you get um, with Google Maps with using the API, and you, can, and you can use this sample code for your own app. Uh, another thing, this is a really cool demo here from one of our gurus. Um, 
So let's say that I'm doing a massive road trip and I am obsessed, actually I'm really obsessed with Taco Bell right now. So I've been in Australia for the last six months and Australia is fantastic and has wonderful kangaroo meat but they have no Taco Bell. So I have like a massive craving for Taco Bell right now. It's the best burritos in the world. Um, so let's see. So I can do a driving directions route here and then um, this demo queries against this guy's server to see what Taco Bells are along that route. Um, and I can say, you know, I, win it, I want it within 10 miles or more. Um, I'm not willing to really go that far, so I'd probably do less. Let's say there's not really enough Taco Bells, so I'm going to open myself up and also go for some McDonald's and some Burger Kings. And now you see that there's so many results that he's chosen to cluster them. Um, so this is a really nice thing to do, and, and clustering is like the new hot thing this year. Um, so uh, here he's using... Um, some cluster markers and say, all right, so there's 61 results there. I can zoom in and there the clusters break out and I can actually see the individual McDonald's and, and Taco Bell. So now on my road trip, I'm gonna be all set with you know, ridiculous junk food that I get to eat. Um, but it's very, this is a very good experience for the user to actually see things, POIs along the route that they're planning. All right, uh, another thing here, along the lines of a road trip, let's say you've got six different places you wanna hit up, and you wanna figure out the best way to hit up all those places. So this is a classic problem in computer science known as the traveling salesman problem, right? Now the cool thing is, you can actually kinda solve this in JavaScript. I know, it's like O of NP and it's really hard and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, if you're gonna do less than, assuming you have less than like 23 places to go to, uh, it's actually reasonable to solve this in JavaScript um, with the help of our directions API. So let's say I've got these six places and then I'm gonna say, all right, calculate the fastest round trip. Uh, it goes and tries a couple things and then finds the, the correct result for me here. Um, so it's, I, I'm pretty impressed um, by the fact that this is so fast and, and feasible purely in the client. And uh, this was written by a developer, which we later hired. So if you can solve O of NP things in JavaScript, we'll hire you. <laughs> um, so here we have standard driving directions, and I wanted them to be printable, because people often want to print their directions. So I'm using the static maps API, which we offered last year. And really just showing, here's the whole route, here's the start, and here's the end. Uh, so that's something else to do with your directions, is make them so they work better when printed or maybe from a mobile device. Um, so the Static Maps API does support markers and polylines and labeling, so um, for the most part, up to a certain number of vertices, you will be able to do directions in it as well. All right, so that's directions. So hopefully I've sh shown you that there's something different you could be doing with the directions on your site, or if you don't have directions at all yet, you should certainly integrate them. It's always good to actually know how to get places. I usually just wander around and, and ask homeless people, but um, that doesn't work out so well. So uh, something else that we did this last year was we came up with the new terms of use. And some of the parts of the new terms were happy for people and some parts other people didn't like as much, but I'll talk about the happy part. <laughs> um, so one thing that we didn't enable before that we now enable is actually using the Maps API for desktop applications. And we, we enabled this because we specifically wanted to encourage people creating Air applications. Anyone here used um, develop in Air? And does anyone use TweetDeck? Yeah, so um, that's one of the more popular Air apps. But basically, Air is a, uh, it's a plugin or a runtime that works with both Flash and JavaScript. And Adobe created it because they wanted to enable rich internet applications on the desktop. So having the capabilities of the desktop like clipboard and dragging and dropping from the desktop and doing local storage and offline and all that kind of things that you expect from a desktop application. Um, so we wanted to make it so that people could create map applications for the desktop. And I'll show you actually from my Flex Builder, one of those. So here's our, our ActionScript API. Um, and I'm gonna use the clipboard. So I have this little demo here, which is a map. Well, I'll just paste in it. Um, so what this does is it takes something from the clipboard. So let's say that this is in my clipboard, San Francisco. And 
thing it really loaded. Let me reload that one. So I'm actually building it um, from here because I'm not assigned a publisher, so it's not available online. All right, so here's my map. Now I can just control V, and what that did was it grabbed from the clipboard and it sent it to the geocoder and then created a point uh, where it thought that address was. Um, there's other demos that you know read in a CSV from the desktop or uh, update, do little Flickr updates and notify you in the panel when there's a new Flickr photo in a stream that you're listening to. So this is the kind of things that you can do with desktop map applications. All right, so reverse geocoding. We just saw forward geocoding in that demo. Now we go reverse geocoding. So reverse geocoding is the opposite of forward. So instead of going from address to latitude longitude, you go from a latitude longitude to an address. Um, now the thing is you can also go to multiple addresses. So usually when you reverse geocode, there's lots of different things that that point might represent. It might represent a street address, it might represent a state, it might represent a park, uh, a nearby POI. Um, so the cool thing about reverse geocoding is that you can use it for so many different things. It's not really as straightforward as normal geocoding. So there's a couple different examples here. So we can look at the standard example. Um, which is just, you know, you click on the map, and here, that's the address that it thinks that point is. And you can use this, if you're doing a tool to let people create maps, this is a good thing to use, um, because usually when you're creating a map making tool, you wanna give them a couple options. Like one, if they already know the address, they can enter that address, you geocode it, maybe let them drag the marker around. If they don't know the address, but they geographically know where it is on the map, then you give them a little marker tool and let them click on the map. So here, this is just, reverse geocoding as I click. So this is great because I can build up all these addresses um, just by clicking on the map. So here's a game that I created based on the reverse geocoder. So what this does is it randomly queries for a point in the viewport and gets an address for it and then quizzes you on it. So here we have South Dakota. I don't really know anything about America. Oh, I'm doing good. N ND. Oh, North Dakota. LA, it's not Los Angeles, is it? Nevada, Nevada. Unorganized, there's a city called Unorganized. That's amazing. I feel like they don't have a very good reputation. Kentucky. I don't remember if there's a timer on this game. Yeah, yeah, there is, okay. Missouri, Louisiana, Idaho. I'm awesome. Um, <laughs> so this is cool, because I can just generate all these addresses without uh, you know, me having to build up this database myself. And if I was gonna build it myself, it would not look like this, because I really don't know that South Dakota is a state. So, uh, let's see, and there's one more. Uh, there's also, um, there's a cool site, and there's a couple sites like this called Meetways. So this is to help you meet your friends halfway. Um, so actually, you'll put in the start point, and you'll put in their point, and then it will figure out geographically what point is in the middle, and then it'll reverse geocode that, and then find other information about that place. And uh, here's something cool, is a control that we added to the API after we released the reverse geocoder. And what that does is just puts a little thing at the top that says what the viewport is that you're currently looking at. Um, so it's nice, because you can just go around and kind of learn Orange, Morris, New Jersey, bucks. So it's good just to see what kind of random city names that we have in the world. All right. Um, so something else that you can do, which is becoming more frequent lately, is actually tell the user where they are when they're looking at that map. So this is nice, because when you go to a map site, there's usually some default viewport that um, that, that company picks or that website picks when you go to it, and it's really annoying because usually you have to go and put in your address and say, no, no, this is actually where I am. And that takes you extra time every time you go to the site. Like when I'm in Australia, I go to maps.google.com because I always go to everything at .com, and it's always showing me the United States, and I'm like, it's hard. Why do I want to see the United States? I'm not in the United States. Show me where I am. Um, so unfortunately, Google Maps doesn't do this yet, but you guys can all do it for your applications. Um, so you can use this client location API, and uh, it will just use the IP of the user to get a rough guess of where that user is, so it'll tell you the latitude and the longitude, uh, the city, the state, the country, 
And then you can roughly center the viewport around that area so that the user doesn't have to do as much work to get to what they're interested in on your site. And one of my favorite examples of that is a site that has unfortunately been taken down. I don't know why. Um, it's called Hookup Maps, and it was a <laughs> it was a Craigslist exotic services mashup. Um, <laughs> and it's fantastic because as soon as you go to it, it would show you everything in the local area, right? So you can get straight. Was that a popsicle? Sorry. Um, <laughs> So it would show you, you know, what you need. <laughs> and the great thing is when I visited it, because I originally used this example in China, when I visited in China, it immediately told me that it had no data for China, because apparently China doesn't like exotic services. I don't know. Um, and it would tell me, look, this is where we do have the data, and you can go and choose that region and go there. And so this was a fantastic user experience for me, because I didn't have to, like, keep searching to try and figure out if there was any data for my region. I knew instantly. So it was an amazing site, and it even had little heart icons, because um, that's what exotic means. And, uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, it's, it's down now, so we'll have to petition to get it back up. All right, so do you guys all like money? Yeah, me neither. That's fine. So some people do, so we'll talk about it anyway. Um, so one thing that, actually, you know, John was, has been asking us for the last, he asked originally like two years ago when we launched directions, like when are you going to make it easier to monetize the API and have really good AdSense for the API? So this year we actually announced um, two different new ways of monetizing the API. Um, so one of them is, is the Google bar. So Google bar is basically a little search box you can put on your map. It'll turn your logo into a shiny search box and then people can search for local businesses and they can search for addresses using that. And we added AdSense to it so that you can go and actually supply your AdSense publisher ID. And, uh, and when people do a search, they'll get a result, and then you can get money if they click on that result. So I'll show you that. So here, I've searched for Thai in San Francisco. Presumably, I got tired of Taco Bell. And uh, you can see there's, a, there's an ad up there, and I can click on the ad, and, and then uh, the guys who made this website will make money off of that. So this is basically AdSense for search. Now, we just launched something even more recently called the Maps Ad Unit. And John actually was our trusted tester of this. He was the, pretty much the sole trusted tester, but he was a really good tester, so thank you. And um, so we'll go and look at it on his site. You have 100% because it's a bit harder to see. Um, so what this does is that it puts a little ad block on the map, and you can have one or two ads. and um, It'll actually update that ad block with relevant ads whenever the user moves a viewport. So we have some magic secret sauce or whatever to try and figure out what the best ads are for a particular viewport, and then we'll update it as it goes along. So right now I'm in Los Angeles, and the best ad here is Ruth's Chris Steakhouse, because everyone knows that's the best steak in Los Angeles, and anyone going to Los Angeles will want to go there. Um, so we, it does a pretty good job at guessing what will be good um, clickable ads for that viewport. And we've seen really good results with it so far. And um, hopefully you guys can try it out and let us know how it works for you. You hear that? I didn't say anything. He said it. Um, so yeah, so there we go. And uh, hopefully next year we'll, we'll have even more stats about that. And so if you guys have more questions about monetization of the site and about the stuff we just showed, there's actually office hours for maps monetization going on right now <laughs> uh, from 1 to 2. So you can leave now and go ask if you're just really, really curious. Or just wait till after the talk and you can head to the office hours. I think they're just way down there. And talk to Mike Pegg from uh, Google Maps Mania. All right. Um, so this is something really cool. I haven't talked about the Flash API much yet. Uh, but the Flash API is something we launched a year ago, and uh, it's actually really cool because there's some stuff you can do in Flash that you simply can't do in JavaScript. So I'm going to talk about one of those things that we've been seeing a lot of in the last few weeks. So this is recoloring the tiles. And um, you can do this in, in Flash because of how easy it is to apply transforms to anything in Flash. So here's this demo here. And you can see I can go and change the stuff here. I'll make it. Oh, that's not very pretty. All right, so here we go. Now I've got a pink map. 
This is obviously really pink. Um, so something I should mention is that you can do this recoloring, but you do have to uh, send us an email and let us know what the recoloring looks like so we can approve it. Because we don't actually want anyone making maps that are this pink. Because it's simply a, a bad experience for the, the users out there, right? And we want to encourage good user experience. So this pink is bad, right? But there are definitely um, some things you can do that are really good. So let me show you some of those. Um, so here is an example. This is a an interactive slideshow of people, 900 people in Japan wearing a parka. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's, it's somewhat addictive to watch, but uh, you can see the map down there. They've really kind of desaturated and given a bit of a blue tint, so that the things that stand out are are the icons, and it's a nice uh, visual effect for what they're trying to achieve here. So a more practical example is here. This is for routes and other things that I can't read in German. Um, and you see they've basically, they've grayed out the tiles behind so that the routes really stand out on top. And so then I can go and plan my little trip here. And I think, personally, I think this looks really, really slick. Uh, yeah, so those are the ones I wanted to show. Um, this is what the code looks like. You're just creating a color matrix filter and then applying that to the map. And uh, one other example of how you can use it is somebody uses it so that when the map is loading, they actually gray out the map so that people kind of don't pay attention to the map because it's a, it's a side part of their site. And then they only recolor the map once the map has entirely loaded in. So I thought that was a really nice visual effect as well. All right, and so now let's talk about something that we haven't actually released yet, and that's 3D Flash. So let me just show you what this looks like. All right, so here's a standard map in Flash, right? Now, we decided to see what would happen if we made it 3D. And then we made a new control. It looks a lot like Earth. And so we can pan and zoom. So this isn't full 3D with a terrain, right? That if you want full 3D with a terrain, you should go to the Earth API and use all their fancy, shiny things. Um, but this is a what we call a 3D perspective. So we can go and add stuff to it. And let me go zoom in here. It's pretty cool because this stuff actually like stands up. You can see as I move. And you can see the shadows lengthening as if they're in 3D. Let me put on a little info window. Here we go. So it's pretty nifty and um, we, we managed to do this both in Flash 9 and 10. So Flash 10 actually has native 3D, so it wasn't too difficult to do it there. Well, too difficult, maybe. <laughs> the engineer is here, and he doesn't really think that was an accurate description. But uh, in Flash 9, we kind of had to create our own technique for doing it. And you can talk with Mike if you're curious about the, the crazy math that he employed to do that. Um, but for you as a developer, it's really, really easy to use. All you have to do is say that you want this perspective view of your map. And if you want to let them actually navigate around, you can go and add that new 3D navigation control to it. And I don't really know how people are going to use it. We just kind of thought it would be a really cool thing. And we'll put it out there and hopefully see some different uses of it. Because it's, it's kind of, it's in between this 2D and this 3D thing. So there should be some things that it'll be good for that maybe the Earth is overkill for, but the 2D isn't quite good enough for. So that would be pretty interesting. And we're going to release it when, Mike? <laughs> yeah, tomorrow? OK, great. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so that was basically our grab bag of things with the Geo APIs. I mean, the point is there's a lot of APIs out there. And when I was making this slide, I kept forgetting about other ones that I hadn't added to it yet. And there's a lot of different features that these, I, these APIs have and a lot of different ways you can use them. Um, and so hopefully you guys will take a little bit from this talk and integrate it into your apps. For those of you that are already Geo developers, we are launching today, I guess, this developer qualification program. Um, and this is because for a long time there's been a lot of Geo developers that were really strongly qualified and, and we would get requests for developers and say, 
well, yeah, you can go and post in the forum, and there's a couple people we know, but we had no formal way of recognizing those qualified de developers and of recommending them and, and pointing people to, you know, like an official list of, of uh, qualified developers. So we've done this developer qualification program, and what you can do is you can sign up and get qualified, and you prove yourself by doing a, a test. You guys, you know, if you miss uni, university, um, you do references, right, so people you've worked with. You do community participation, so if you're very active in the forums, your community participation will help you. Um, and I think one other aspect. So using all that information about you combined, we use that to decide, okay, this person is qualified, let's badge them and you know, put them in our gallery of qualified developers. So for those of you that are geo developers and maybe are freelancers or, or somebody that wants to say, hey, I'm, I'm available, then you should get certified, get qualified, and, uh, and you'll get a badge and you'll get in the gallery and, and then we'll get to recommend you to everyone. And you can get a shirt too, or a sticker. Yay. So that's it. And, uh, and now we have time for questions. So if you have questions, you can come up to the mic. We're also looking at, uh, we have questions on moderator too, right? Oh yeah, maybe. How do we get there? Got a question on reverse geocoding. Uh, yep. What happens to sort of the IP and copyright when you do the reverse geocoding? Uh, IP and copyright? Yep. Of the data? Yeah, and the data you get. You know, if you put it into your own database, what are the rights and so the restrictions with our are? So with both our forward and our reverse geocoder, our terms of service say that the results must uh, eventually be used with a map. So you can't use the reverse geocoder if you're never going to display the results on a map. Um, so the thing is, when you display the results on the map, we have the attribution on the map, so that takes care of it. Specifically um, on a Google map. Yeah, yeah, on a Google map, yeah. <laughs> right, but are you also allowed to store them in the database and use them for other purposes, as long as you also display them on the map? For other purposes? Um, that gets a bit trickier, what other purposes? Well, there might be a historic uh, record of uh, places that somebody has been interested in, for instance. Uh, as long as yeah, those places will then be displayed on a map. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's a bit tricky. You can talk with, uh, Mickey has volunteered himself to be spoken to. That's Mickey Art. So I should mention that basically like half our engineering team is in the audience right now. So Mickey's right there. He's a product manager. He loves legal questions, terms of use, <laughs> favorite. He's always like, man, we should just talk about law stuff all day. Yeah, okay. that's true, thanks. He proposed a whole session on it, but conference on it, we, we turned them down. Hi there, I brought my laptop up because I've got three questions, if that's all right. Yeah. Uh, the first one is the Static Maps API. Um, any news or updates on the idea of uh, having polyline encoding for the Static Maps? Yeah, we're working on it. Okay. Uh, the second one was the reverse geocoding. Is, that, uh, is there a REST interface for that or is it all JavaScript? Yeah, it it's just the same. Um, it's the, the same like uh, URL pattern, but you mm -hmm. send a uh, latitude longitude in instead of an address. So no, we, we upgraded the geocoder documentation because it, um, it wasn't that clear for a while. So if you look at the documentation now, you'll see a whole, basically geocoding service is standalone now. Um, although you do need to use it with a map, but you see a section here on reverse geocoding. You can see the results. Okay, and the last one was, uh, as far as the ad monetization you were just talking about, um, is there, are there any plans to incorporate standard IAB advertising sizes, like the 300 by 250, for instance, is the best monetized ad unit that I've ever seen on my site, and given that it just puts two there right now, I was thinking about, is there a way that people are gonna be able to target image ads into that slot that are 300 by 250 as opposed to just the two stacked text ads? So right now, they're all text ads. Um, we're not serving up any image ads. And we did play, we played around with sizes for a bit, but we decided just to go with the simple one and two for mm -hmm. now. I just say with monetization, it's kind of, um, we're constantly experimenting. So we've announced these two things, but um, we're, we, we keep experimenting with other things as well, stuff like size and, and different types of ads. I don't really see us doing image ads anytime soon. But you never know. So monetization in maps, it's, it's a really interesting problem. 
figuring out like what somebody looking at a map is actually there for, mm -hmm. right? Because everyone using a map is there for a different reason. Um, so we're always experimenting, and um, we'll, I'm sure we'll, we'll keep coming up with different options for you. Right. We're also trying to keep. Oh, sorry, we're we're also trying to keep in mind both, you know, the publisher's needs, um, but also the user experience. So if we're serving up image ads on a map. It, it might it might block part of the map, and that's that's a bad user experience. So there's there's a lot of there's a there's a lot of thought and work going into it. Um, John, were you about to say something? You, yeah. you want to do you want to say it at a mic so that. Yeah, so that's something to experiment with is like how can we do similar ads but maybe not be as obtrusive for some users. So yeah. something to keep working on. Close in a, uh, I work in a closed environment and we're using the enterprise server, the Google enterprise server. Uh, my impression right now is that the Google Maps API that's available for the you know enterprise server is not as robust as for the public Google Maps. Can you comment on this and can you offer suggestions because we we want to build robust <coughs> applications but you know we can't use your public services at this point. Right. The enterprise server, does, um, the development on that moves around a little bit more slowly because um, it's hard to deploy, to redeploy um, uh, changes as, as things go on. We have to be really careful because it's a, you know, the, the server itself is a downloadable application. Um, we are going to have some enterprise people around at the conference who would, might be. Yeah, so Could with you know the. Oh, Tor. Hi, Tor. Uh, Tor. Okay, Sorry, too. I didn't see you. Tor is <laughs> the enterprise version of me. Yeah, so go, <laughs> go, go talk to Tor. <laughs> so when someone searches for like a large uh, um, region on, on Google Maps, it knows where to zoom it to. Like if you typed in Russia, it would like show the yeah. whole of Russia. Um, but I. I didn't see a way that you could actually get the uh, the bounding box on a region in the public API. Is there any way that you can get that information? Yeah. Um, so apparently we, yeah, so that's not in the docs, is it? Um, so a few months ago or six months ago, we started adding bounds information to the mm -hmm. geocoding output, and that's the recommended viewport bound. Oh, it's it's just in the output when you geocode then? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, I don't know if it's in the docs. Um, it's in the extended data for the KML output. Okay. Extended. Can you get yeah. that with the JavaScript API? Yep, you can. Just use the, because there's uh, one function that gives you the full JSON. So just do the function that gives you the full JSON, and then you can parse out the bounds from that JSON. OK, thank you. And uh, if you're using a KML network link on maps or on Earth, it, it can send back the bounding box to the server, and then you can decide what to return. Yeah, I was curious uh, what you thought might think of a, an, an HTML6 element for maps. Oh, yeah. So we just had WearCamp, and um, that was one of the things we discussed at WearCamp was there's a, there's a video element in HTML5. Why isn't there a map element? I think that's a really good idea, and I actually couldn't. Now, here's the problem. There already is a map element in HTML, image maps. So we're going to have to come up. I was thinking we could call it like GeoMap or Real Map or something like that. <laughs> um, so I think that's a great idea. That it doesn't technically af affect us. So it, it would probably mean if there was a map element in HTML, I would imagine that would mean each browser would implement it themselves. Each browser would probably pick a provider or you know maybe use Open Data. Um, and then for so for that would be for people who wanted really really simple maps. I think it's a great idea, right? You say like map center equals this, zoom equals this. Um, yeah, but you know, yeah. like the uh, the image uh, element allows you to put your image into it, or your you know whatever you decide. Yeah. A video element, same same idea, I guess, right? So maybe a map would have Google on the one hand and my. Server, right. so my the, OGC server on the other. The model with the video element is that it uh, you link to a particular video, and then the browser decides what um, what application, what plugin to, to use to display yeah. it. Yeah. So you could you could feasibly have a map element refer to a KML file. I could I could see that. I don't know that it would go because I mean HTML targets the simplest case, so I don't know that it would go as far as like enabling custom map types. So I think that so it would be really I think cool for developers if there was a 
an HTML5 map element, but I think that we'll always need maps APIs in order to really do the full power. Oh yeah, power. absolutely. Yeah. But you know, you can see something simple, yeah. like because HTML is kind of meant to be simple for people. Just right. To cut so and there's um, the what wig mailing list accepts uh, suggestions, and I think we should email the suggestion to them. All right. Spec it out. Make it happen. I'm interested in doing something that currently I think is not allowed by the uh, license agreement, which is to print maps onto thin slices of dead trees, uh, meaning paper. <laughs> <laughs> I know people here may not use that anymore, but uh, I was sending out invoices, and uh, what I wanted to do was create a, an invoice for a customer, and on the flip side, have a map centered on their location showing our locations nearby. In this case, it was for a car sharing application. And uh, that's not allowed right now, printing. Can you comment on whether that will be? Um, so we came out with this set of printing permissions guidelines, which applies generally to all of our geo products, because people ask a lot about screenshots and stuff. Mm -hmm. So this maybe came out last year. And so printing has actually, there's, uh, it's gotten a bit more uh, relaxed. Um, so you can read through, through the rules, but one of the basic ones is if you're doing less than 5,000 copies, um, then a, a screenshot of maps is okay, so that's, that's a very simple version of the rules, but um, if you look through the guidelines, I think you'll see it's a bit more permissive now. Um, if I wanted to do more than a screenshot, meaning a slightly higher resolution version for print, uh, what would I do in terms of uh, using the API to, to get more bits for my high resolution printer? Uh, so right now the APIs are all designed for the web, so you'll see that the outputs we have are JPEG, PNG, GIF, and they're all resolution designed for the web. So we have not optimized the APIs to be printable, and uh, it, that's certainly a feature request that we could consider as offering higher resolution, but uh, it, I don't think it'd be our immediate thing that we'd want to do. Yeah, that's features. the kind of thing that I would be willing to pay some per uh. per thin slice of dead tree fee for. Okay, yeah. that's a, well, that's a good idea. Um, so, um, some maybe people we'll use uh, static maps because you because they are images. They're yeah, they tend it's to just be the resolution. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah. Well, what I what I've done is I've tiled them up in you know larger sizes than they should be, and then squashed them back down, and that works. But it's really a hack. Shh. <clears throat> anyway, I'd be happy to pay for that. Did you get that part? Sorry. I didn't, yeah, yeah. I didn't no, that's good. You. That's a really great idea. <laughs> we'll totally charge you for it. <laughs> <laughs> you can you can pay me. Just see me after. <laughs> Five dollars. <laughs> I give you five hundred DPI. One dollar per hundred. Okay, we got uh, <laughs> time for a couple more questions. Oh, uh, there is a moderator question. Oh. Um. Oh. So there. Okay, I can. So where the, will there be a mobile version of your client APIs? BlackBerry, Symbian, JTM, etc. So with mobile, there is um, a for iPhone. <laughs> There is a framework called MapKit, so you can do Google Maps in your native apps. For Android, there's an API called MapView, so you can embed that in your, app, in your apps. For the other ones, there's nothing in particular. Um, our current story is to use the Static Maps API, since that's like kind of lowest common denominator in a browser control in those. Um, but there is an entire session tomorrow about Maps API in mobile, and you never know what they might talk about there. So you should probably go. <laughs> <laughs> and the other question was, any plans to integrate zip plus four data into Google Maps? Yahoo has done it. Well, so we should probably do everything that Yahoo does, because they're going so well. Um, <laughs> uh, Sorry, I, on? <laughs> I, I think we've looked at it, but I don't think we have any immediate plans for that, no. That's true, yeah, so you answered the question because somebody asked about that earlier. Um, so yeah, so there, I guess we, there probably isn't a great source of data for that right now that's really complete. And I don't know how many people know there's a plus four. I don't know mine. No. <laughs> Remember, if, I, if it doesn't help me, then we don't do it. <laughs> you live in Sydney. <laughs> 300,000 changes per month. Okay, I think we um, have officially run out of time. Uh, if you want, we will be in, you can come up and ask us questions during the transition, and also uh, I'll be hanging out in office hours much of the day. There are other talks, so thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>